said to me, Alfred, do you know that there's a library on 42nd Street? I says, I do, but I was never there. He says, that's where you belong. You get all the literature in the world, and it doesn't cost you a dime. I read an immense number of books because I wanted to understand the American people's minds. I wanted to be completely American and forget all of my past. Immigrants themselves bringing new languages and customs were making the culture of the city just that much more diverse. The immigrant nourishment that this nation has always had, the incoming people, has been an extremely important part of our vitality, our ingenuity. It's like aerating the, the stream of life here. Early in this century, one in three residents of major American cities had been born somewhere else. New York had twice as many Irish as Dublin, and Chicago had more Poles than Warsaw. We had Polish people, we had Irish people, we had Jewish people, and we had Italian people. And they were all friendly, and we were all in the same boat. None of us had any money. Grandparents, the only place they can get rooms, literally, was on Elizabeth Street, which is where my mother was born. Uh, the apartment was two and a half rooms, three rooms, and maybe 14 people were living in it. And at night, it looked like, you know, a hospital ward, I would think, with all these beds and all these people sleeping in these different beds. They were no bathrooms, they were toilets. They were in the hallway. But my mother and father, thought that this was wonderful because in the old country the toilets were in the backyard and the fact that in the kitchen we had not only running water so that you didn't have to go to the well for water but we had hot water my mother every week that she did the wash she said how wonderful how wonderful we have hot water Steadily rising income and declining work hours meant that for the first time, even working class people could go out in search of entertainment. Five cents bought a ticket to the newest entertainment phenomenon, moving pictures. We were so taken with the, the nickel shows. Two of us would uh, beg to be admitted by sitting on one seat. The earliest movies introduced simultaneously in France and the United States in the 1890s were simple tableau of anything that moved, either make-believe or what was called actuality. In 1903 came the first American film that actually told a story, The Great Train Robbery, a Western filmed in New Jersey. Its huge success made it clear that fiction was what the audience wanted most. There was comedies. And then there was The Pearls of Pauline, which was a serial that went on every Saturday afternoon. Every week she was in a, a situation where her life was at stake. A lot of kids it, it wasn't, it wasn't a movie to them, it was actuality. Beginning in 1910, Americans were also seeing newsreels from around the world. It's coming as a great force for mass entertainment and for mass culture. There is this sense of possibility, the sense of openness, the sense of widening the horizons. What it does is it opens the world. In Havana Harbor on February the 15th, 1898, a mysterious explosion sank an American cruiser, the USS Maine. 266 officers and sailors were killed. Cuba was a Spanish colony 90 miles from Florida. Although there was no evidence of Spanish involvement, 
cries of revenge against Spain swept across America. But President William McKinley, who would lead America into the 20th century, was reluctant to go to war. President McKinley is a silver-tongued orator, very popular, sweet man, but a very indecisive man. They used to say that McKinley's mind is like an unmade bed. You have to make it up for him before he can use it. Much more eager for war and foreign adventure in general was McKinley's young assistant secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was a great believer in outdoorism, a great believer in activity. He was vigorous, you know, you could imagine him sort of taking cold showers all the time. And he carried all this in his character into his politics. He was a great believer in American power, in American imperialism, a great believer in war. War is one of the highest forms of human endeavor, he wrote. With Roosevelt and others lobbying intensely for it, Congress declared war on Spain in April of 1898. Roosevelt left his job in Washington to join the campaign in Cuba. Theodore Roosevelt organizes his old cowboy buddies from the West into the Rough Riders and goes to Brooks Brothers and gets a uniform made uh, and, and gets out a big saber and goes down there and storms San Juan Hill. It took the United States less than three months to defeat Spain in what one American official called a splendid little war. The spoils of war for the United States were the Spanish colonies of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. The United States was now an empire. At the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York in September 1901, President McKinley was killed by an assassin with no particular cause beyond his own dissatisfaction. Theodore Roosevelt, by then vice president, became America's leader. He's really the first president who sees the United States as a global power. America's century begins really with Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was an imperialist. He actually gloried in the term. And he wanted the United States to be a real empire exercising great power in the same ways that the great European empires did. Roosevelt's design included linking the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans by building a canal through the Isthmus of Panama in northern Colombia. Such a canal would greatly facilitate shipping and ensure America's strategic hold on the region. But when the Colombians refused to cooperate, Roosevelt encouraged the Panamanians to revolt against their Colombian rulers. Within a couple of days, we recognized the new independent republic of Panama, and within uh, another few days, we had concluded a treaty with them. Roosevelt said, when other people dithered, and when other people uh, debated, I acted, you know, I took action. Construction of the era's engineering wonder began in 1904. Alfred Bingham visited the canal site as a child. I can remember riding along in this car on the bottom of the canal. A lot of big machinery and uh, a lot of uh, trains going up and down, taking the diggings out. And there were marvelous big structures that were the, to be the locks. The building of the canal itself was the greatest engineering feat that had ever been done up to that time. And, and it, it's, it's all of the great power and technology and energy of this age harnessed there. There's a wonderful photo of Theodore Roosevelt at, uh, at the controls of one of these gigantic steam shovels that they use to dig out the, the ditch. The Panama Canal is a wonderful expression, not only of him, but in many ways of America of that time. In mid-August of 1914, Americans celebrated the opening of the Panama Canal, a triumph of both technology and man's will over nature. 
an engineering feat as impressive as the pyramids, the canal would also become the symbol of America's entrance into the international arena at a time when the world was becoming more dangerous. That same week, the great powers of Europe were headed for a violent encounter that none of them could even imagine, promoted by German ambition. Early in this century, Germany had emerged as the industrial power in Europe, rivaling Britain and already mightier than France, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Russia. But as Europe's youngest empire, Germany wielded little political influence. We felt Germany is really a great power and a leader of nations and wanted at least to be equal to others, not be considered less important than other powers like England. Under Kaiser Wilhelm, Germany was training the best land army in the world, five million men, and had begun building a powerful navy. To build that navy required nerve because it was a direct challenge to Britain. And that conflict between Britain and Germany is at the heart of international affairs before 1914. Britain responded by launching the most powerful warship on Earth, the Dreadnought. It was a revolution in naval warfare. It was an all-big gun ship. Big 12-inch guns. Also, the uh, Dreadnoughts had the latest technological equipment on them. had electrical equipment, for example. Once the British had a dreadnought, the Germans had to have a dreadnought, etc., etc. The tensions fed by an arms race and rivalry among the major European powers finally came to a head in June of 1914, when Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist in Sarajevo. There was no reason why the assassination of Franz Ferdinand would signal the collision of fundamental interests. It was a matter of choice, and that choice was made in Vienna and in Berlin to make it more than an assassination. In late July, with Germany's support, the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia. And within days, all the great powers of Europe, bound by their various alliances, were at war with each other. I was at a camp, a boys' camp in New Hampshire in 1914 when the war was declared, and it was a shock to a very peaceful world. But nobody took it too seriously. The war was bad, of course, but it was also something that would be temporary and would not have a far-reaching effect. But this war would be more catastrophic than any which had gone before, one in which technology, the engine of progress, would be used in the slaughter of millions, a war that would sow greater hatred and result in far greater consequences than anyone could imagine in that summer of 1914. What was optimistically called the war to end all wars would draw America into an increasingly complex and dangerous world. That's on the next episode of The Century, America's Time. I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us.